Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Placer Valley 2023. I hope everybody's enjoying their days so far. I certainly am. Um, I'm pleased to be here to introduce our next speaker, um, who's joining us today largely due to the work of our actual CEO, Jane Christensen. And if you've ever met Jane, you know that she loves to read, and she's an amazingly fast texter. So as she was joining others in helping plan this event and thinking about keynote speakers, she enthusiastically recommended Margaret O'Mara. So the parallel is that Jane recognized between Margaret's work looking at technology, politics, urban development, and growth in the Silicon Valley, parallel with the growth that Placer County is facing today. So before Jane even finished touting Margaret's work, everybody at her table had already received a text link to buy one of Margaret's books. So for those of you not overly familiar with Margaret, she is a professor at the University of Washington as the Scott and Dorothy Bullitt Chair of American History. She teaches courses in the history of technology, history of capitalism, modern politics, and urban and metropolitan history. She's the author of several acclaimed books on the history of modern technology. Those books are The Code, Silicon Valley and the Remaking of America, and Cities of Knowledge, Cold War Science and the Search for the Next Silicon Valley. Her byline has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Wired, the MIT Technology Review, America Prospect, and other national and international publications. Before I ask Margaret to come on stage, I'd like to thank the Placer County Board of Supervisors and the other elected officials here today for their commitment to forward-thinking policies that are facilitating growth in a meaningful way. I'd also like to thank all of you here today because of the unprecedented growth in Placer County is due because of you and is supported by you and your collaboration and our partnerships. Your commitment to getting growth right is very much appreciated and will be remembered for a long time to come. Now, please join me with a warm welcome for your keynote speaker, Margaret O'Mara. Thank you so much, Daniel, for that really kind intro. Um, and thank you also to, I wish Jane were here. I'm sorry she's not. And thank you to all of the event organizers and everyone who came together to make this such a great event. I'm really excited to be here with you guys. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the power of transformational leadership. This is the day about transformational leadership. and. Um, I'm really excited to be, talk, you know, this is, a, this is, I was saying backstage that talking about this subject here and talking about what I'm going to be talking about for the next 30 minutes or so here is kind of a great job for me because there's a lot of really great things I have to say and things to get excited about, about this region. I don't have to work really hard to talk about transformation and innovation and possibility and thoughtful planning and community in a place like this one, and that's really exciting. And coming here gave me an opportunity, too, to kind of, I'm a history nerd, I'm a history professor, so the first thing I often do when I'm going to a place is I'm like, I want to find out everything about its history. So I want to shout out to the city of Roseville and the Roseville Historical Society for helping me learn about this region's history, um, as well as the California Historical Society and other things that I, other places that I go to when I want to learn about this part of California, Placer County and this part of California. Um, this is a photo of Roseville's Pioneer Store, opened in 1865. I don't know this exact this exact store was the one that, that opened uh, this building, but this is where it was by about 1875. Opened by W.A. Thomas. Post office had rooms above. This is one of a number of early startups in this area. Entrepreneurial startups. 
a lean startup, you might say. Not a lot of resources, but an ambitious one. One that was taking a bet on an area that was just becoming an, the agricultural area it did become, an area that had just been transformed by the transcontinental railroad coming through this valley and other railroads crisscrossing up and down, becoming the junction, the center, the con place of connection and interconnection. And so by about 18, I don't know exactly when the, what the date of this photograph is, and maybe there's someone here who knows exactly when this photo was taken, but I think I could probably, an educated guess would be somewhere in the 1880s, and I want to say 1886, and that's just because in 1886, halfway around the world, in Stuttgart, Germany, Robert Bosch opened a workshop for, for precision mechanics and electrical engineering hired two workmen, and that was the beginning of the Bosch Corporation that earlier this year has acquired TSI Semiconductor and that has become one of the biggest and most important business stories in Placer Valley this year. I love these moments of convergence and surprises. And one of the things, one of the reasons I really, really love studying and writing and teaching history is all the surprises, all these unlikely connections, and how different places, different entrepreneurial economies, different entrepreneurs, different leaders, what they build in different places and how they eventually come together, how they converge. So here we are a century and a half later, and we have Robert Bosch's workshop has morphed into a slightly larger enterprise. The descendants of W.A. Thomas, I don't know if they're still here in the Placer Valley, but there certainly are, seem to be a lot of people who are multi-generational parts of this community, as well as, importantly, many, many people who are, came here from somewhere else, chose to come here, particularly in the last several years where I have um, been been told that Roseville and this surrounding area was the sec one of the top two destination cities for U-Hauls moving f into uh, a place in the United States during the last several years of the pandemic. So there is a lot to be, a lot of energy, a lot of excitement. So how, what to do about this? Because one of the challenges is sometimes growth is great. We like growth. We like getting bigger, we like more economic activity, more jobs, but also it can bring its own challenges, right? It can get out, and if, if it's not prepared for and thought, you know, a place might change in a way that the stakeholders who are already there and also all of the stakeholders in the community might not benefit from. And I'm from Seattle. Seattle, the Seattle area is one of those places that's had a lot of economic growth driven by tech in the last several years. And it has had a lot of challenges as the result of that. Challenges with housing affordability, with equity, with education, with traffic. <laughs> and certainly the Bay Area has had a lot of those challenges too. It's one reason that a lot of people are picking up and moving to the Placer Valley. So what can leaders like you, business leaders, political leaders, civic leaders, community leaders, do now? What is the way to take advantage of opportunity? So what I want to talk about today are two, quest two big questions. Uh, what drives dynamic and resilient regional economies, which presumably everyone in this room is very interested in sustaining here? And then what can local leaders do? And how do we answer those questions? Well. You brought a history professor here, so of course I'm gonna say, learn some history, but don't just take it from me. Also take it from Steve Jobs, who told one of his, a, a fellow Silicon Valley historian of mine, he said, you can't really understand what's going on now without understanding what came before. That's a direct quote of Steve Jobs. And the tech industry, Silicon Valley, 
as place and industry is often, it's a building the future sort of place, right? Future thinking forward, thinking ahead. And a lot of people in that industry are really interested in what's happening next and not terribly interested in what happened before. And when I'm speaking to audiences of tech people, I'm, I show this slide a lot. <laughs> um, because it's really, this is, history is not just useful to know, it isn't just nice old pictures to look at and say, oh, remember when, wasn't this nice? That actually having that knowledge of what happened before is really important and foundational for understanding what's happening now and why, what you're planning for and what might work or what your, what your challenges might be. History doesn't repeat itself. It often rhymes. That's a quote attributed to Mark Twain, although I don't think he ever said it. But I think that's a, it's a useful way to think about it. There are patterns, there are continuities. And what happened before does have an effect on what happens now and what happens next. It doesn't mean, it, and nothing is inevitable, things can be changed. But the way to be a transformational leader is to understand the context, be really smart about that historical context, and also understand what you can do to bend that arc, to send things in the direction you want to send them, and what the possibilities are, and learning from leadership. So I have often been asked, what is the secret of Silicon Valley? How did they do it? And so today I'm gonna to tell you all the secrets, <laughs> but actually, the secret of Silicon Valley is actually the secret of places of innovation throughout human history. And it boils down to some pretty simple ingredients. One is investment, money, resources. Someone's got to fund the thing, right? So when every place of innovation through human history, places that have been places of invention, of artistic production, of cultural production, of, of new things coming into the world. There has been someone financing it. There has been a venture capitalist. You can think of someone like Elizabeth I of England as a venture capitalist. She bankrolled Sir Walter Drake's circumnavigation of the globe in the 1570s. Call her original VC, that's kind of interesting to think about, but that's basically what it was, putting money on risky ventures that may or may not work out and might have a big upside, you never know. You need someone to be willing to take a risk and put their money into a venture. The next thing you need are institutions. Institutions, that sounds really boring. What do I mean by that? Institutions can be a lot of things, but essentially places and entities that are outside the market, not businesses, that give people space to create, invent, build something new. Now universities, the oldest one on the African continent, 11, founded circa 1100 in Timbuktu, which was also a center of trade and connection. That's where they, those produce ideas. But it's not just universities. It could be industrial research labs where researchers are freed from the pressure of quarterly earnings and immediate return on investment and are allowed to play around. It could be more informal institutions, but places of, of research, places of learning, places of creation, places where people can come together and create something. And then the third is interconnection. And I'm, you can see I'm just trying to do some alliteration here, but, but really it's about bringing people together who wouldn't ordinarily connect with one another and see what develops. It is not a coincidence that many places that were on trade routes where people from that other different corners of the world were connecting and colliding with one another often became places of artistic and um, scientific creation. Places that were kind of what we would now call third places uh, where people can meet outside of work or school or home and discuss things and connect and make deals. It could be like the Agora of Athens in ancient times where the philosophers came and um, taught, 
uh, shared ideas. It could be the London coffee houses of the 1600s. It could be Starbucks down the street. But you need to have place. You need to have a quality of place and spaces for people to connect. And the thing, the ingredient that brings all of these things together, that makes these different ingredients sing, is leadership. And by that, I mean having people there in the community on the ground who are, have a vision, who are thinking about a bigger plan, thinking about how to bring all of these different assets together and take advantage of opportunities that might be coming from elsewhere and taking advantage of the resources that are in the community and making something bigger, a whole that's bigger than the sum of its parts. So as a way of illustrating this formula in action, I want to talk about Silicon Valley. Now this is Silicon Valley before it was Silicon Valley. This is the Santa Clara Valley, the Valley of the Heart's Delight is what it was called by the San Jose Chamber of Commerce in the 1920s. A place a lot like a lot of agricultural California, not that different. Fruit orchards, fruit trees were its main business. 100 years ago, you might not have predicted that this was going to become what it became. And that's another fun thing about studying history. You're like, you never would have known it. This was not inevitable. This was not foreordained. There were, also, there were some signs, though, 100 years ago, if you looked closely enough. If you went to Palo Alto, you could find a repurposed fruit drying shed where Cluster Radio was located. This is one of several startups electronics companies that are in the vicinity of Stanford University, which was opened in 1890s, where people were kind of playing around with machines and building radio technology, communication technology. Now, so you could point to that and say, aha, they've been doing this the whole time. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you could go almost any place in America and find some guys in garages playing around with stuff in the beginning of the 20th century. It was a very high tinkering <laughs> era of history. You could go to Dayton, Ohio and find the Wright brothers. You could go to, um, at name your city in any part of the country, you would find operations like this. Uh, it was a very inventive, very innovative time full of opportunity for new industries to grow. The thing that really is the hinge that changes the trajectory of the Santa Clara Valley story is investment. It's the military activity of the Second World War and then the Cold War after that. It's money from the federal government. <laughs> and this is, um, this is in Mountain View, California. This is Moffett Field, which was an Air Force facility, a NASA facility. This actual, this actual hangar is now part of Google's campus. It's owned by Google. And uh, just next door to it is where all of the AI and cloud research is going on with Google. So it's all, this, is a, this has been a hotbed of technological transformation for a long time. But the military spending that came to the Pacific West Coast, including the Bay Area, um, and the military installations became this huge wave of money and investment, particularly in, in small electronics and communication devices, which was something that the little startups around Stanford were already specializing in. This investment for the Bay Area and for Silicon Valley, and the future Silicon Valley in particular, really goes into high gear with the space race. As the space race revs up in the late 50s and 60s when John Kennedy announces we shall reach the moon by the end of the 1960s. Well, what do you need to do to send a man to the moon or men to the moon? What do you need to do to get astronauts in orbit? Well, you kind of need the same tech you need for long-range missiles, which was something that the US was also very interested in producing a lot of in the early 1960s. You need very small, very fast, very light electronic devices. You need silicon semiconductors. You need the thing that only, only one region in the United States was really producing super, super high, high advanced um, chips made of silicon, and that was, happened to be this strange little, small little area around Stanford University. 
So Stanford, Stanford now is, you know, is kind of a big part of the Silicon Valley story, right? Uh, what role does that play? Well, this is a, a, you know, another example of a classic institution, why institutions are such an important ingredient of innovation. It's not just resources, it's not just investment, it's not just money. You need spaces, you need places that are outside the market, but are, in a way, partners with and generators of people and ideas, and uh, the place where all of these, it's sort of all these ideas gestate before they become companies. So Stanford is really interesting and unique, and one of the things that I think is really tricky about other regions that have tried to imitate Silicon Valley and had kind of a, 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 a university as a, as a center of an innovation economy is that Stanford has, is kind of weird in that it has certain assets that others don't. Um, this is a picture here of um, one of the things that Stanford had that, that pretty much every university or college or educational institution has that's a real value add is this connection between people, particularly mentorship between faculty and students that creates networks of, kind of intellectual connection and collaboration. And this is the guy with his back to the camera is a guy named Fred Terman, who was the Dean of Engineering and later the Provost of Stanford, so the Chief Academic Officer. And he is shaking hands with two people that might, you might not recognize their, name, their faces, but you'll recognize their names, which is Dave Packard and Bill Hewlett. And, and Hewlett and Packard were determined students at Stanford. He persuaded them to come back to Palo Alto, which was not an industrial center, in 1939 to start their company in a garage behind a house in downtown Palo Alto that became HP. And that, that connection between faculty and students is part of what it makes institutions so potent. But one of the things that set Stanford apart and makes Stanford a particularly potent and an unusual institution and a hard one to imitate is the fact that it owned almost 9,000 acres of land that it was able to develop but could not sell. It was not allowed in its charter to sell the land. And so what it did in the 1950s, and this is an article from the Saturday Evening Post from 1955 um, that is talking about all of the land development Stanford is doing. It's building homes. This is the high, heyday, 1955, high point of post-war suburbanization, right? It's building a shopping center. If anyone's been to the Stanford Shopping Center um, in, down in Palo Alto, right along Sand Hill Road, that's on Stanford land. That's a little fancier than it was in 1955, but it is, it's a Westfield um, property, uh, like the Galleria here. And uh, it was, but it, it also included an industrial park for high-tech industry. Now, this is an example of transformational leadership. Why? Because building an industrial park was something that no economic development expert, none of the architects, none of the planners that Stanford consulted with about what should we do about developing our land, Everyone was like, no, 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 no. You just build as many subdivisions as possible and make as much money as possible from them. You have all this land and the Bay Area is booming and they, all these people will buy these suburban homes. Done and done. And Terman and the other administrators were like, no, we want to encourage companies like HP and other companies that spin off from Stanford as well as other electronics companies to locate here. So we want to build a research park, an industrial park for industry, and that's what we're gonna do, and that's what they did. And that turned out to be a really, really good idea for Stanford, both economically and for the, the, bay, the history of Silicon Valley itself, because it created this concentrated um, industry concentration where there wasn't anything. There weren't facilities like that, and it was right next to Stanford. So this is an example of leaders on the ground seeing opportunity Pushing back a little about what, against what might seem like the smartest, most lucrative, near-term idea. And saying, we are gonna do something that is going to build something that lasts, something that is consistent with our long-term vision for this community. And what Terman and the other leaders of Stanford wanted to see, as well as the other people like Hewlett and Packard wanted to see, was a community of scientific industry. They wanted to create a cluster of scientific industry that was unlike any other, and that's what they were able to do. The other thing that the, the Silicon, early Silicon Valley had as an advantage is that it was, there, it was much smaller in population, 
And so nearly all of the people who were coming there to work on electronics, to work in tech, were from somewhere else. Um, I'm putting up this picture just mostly because I love this picture of these really cute first graders. But these are, these are the children of families that are all moving, transplanting to Palo Alto, um, just as, the, as so many families were moving to the suburbs all over California during this time. But they're a, th this is a place where lots of people from different places are coming together. These are the founders of what's considered to be the first venture-backed startup in the Valley, Fairchild Semiconductor which is an incredibly important company in the story of, of chip making and also of Silicon Valley's history. Fairchild Semiconductor, these, these eight men in the photo are, are, include the two co-founders of Intel, Bob Noyce and Gordon Moore. If you've heard of Moore's Law, which is that idea that chips become um, more and more powerful every, every year and kind of the, the, this extraordinary, these are extraordinary towering people in the, in the field of the business of semiconductors and also the, the, the field of, of, of electric, electrical engineering. One of, but what I want to point out about these eight people is that almost to a person, they came from really, really humble backgrounds and they came, the only person who was actually from California was Gordon Moore himself. These were not people of privilege. These were not people who kind of came into the game with family connections and money. They, left the game with lots of money, <laughs> most of them. These includes, this picture includes the founder, co-founder of Kleiner Perkins, which is one of the leading venture capital firms in Silicon Valley. But they, they came in with not a lot, and they were able to, because of the leadership of people like Fred Terman and others in the Valley, were able to get opportunities to build something to create something new. And that's a real, really important thing to remember at a time of growth and opportunity, to keep that door open to let new talent come in. Because that's part of the secret of Silicon Valley. These were not people who came in with a lot of resources. Packard and Hewlett were not people who came in with a lot of resources. And, and they were able to build a company, a company that also another dimension of leadership for Hewlett Packard itself that was very influential in the Valley was its management style, which was so different from the way that companies ran in the middle of the 1950s. They liked to call it management by walking around. They didn't have corner offices. They wore shirt sleeves and ties. This is, this is really business casual for the 50s and 60s. Like, this is, they are dressing down. They might as well be wearing hoodies or, you know. <laughs> So just imagine that, right? But this is a really different way of, of growing companies, of doing business, and it was something that made Silicon Valley stand out. And what also happens, and this is why this history is important, is that, and why I'm spending a lot of time showing you black and white pictures of people, is because this is a first generation that then gives rise to company after company after company. So one of the things that is really notable about Silicon Valley, and this is also notable about places of innovation throughout human history, is that you one generation then endows the next and the next and the next. The first generation invests in the next generation through venture capital, through mentorship. And so this is a chart, it's kind of, there's a pretty detailed, but it's, it's essentially showing at the center Fairchild Semiconductor, those eight guys I just showed you, that company was the, all the spin-offs from that company were essentially the silicon semiconductor industry in the valley and everywhere. <laughs> this was the beginning. This is the, the granddaddy of it all. One, of the, one important thing to remember about Fairchild Semiconductor, which is seen as this private, private sector triumph, is that it actually was able to get off the ground and be so successful initially because of JFK and the rockets, because NASA had this, uh, was putting in orders for so many light, fast semiconductors and integrated circuits that companies like Fairchild were, were among the very few in the world were building. And so they were able to build a book of business at the very beginning that was like 80% federal contracts, which is a part of the history that sometimes falls out of the Silicon Valley story. It's seen as this free market story where government got out of the way and let the entrepreneurs be entrepreneurs, but actually, 
government funding was really foundational. I think that's really something really important to, to recognize and acknowledge and celebrate at this moment when, after the passage of the CHIPS Act last year, the U.S. government is making an unprecedented investment in this kind of thing. This is opportunity for transformational local leaders to seize. So this flywheel gets us all the way to now. This is the cool thing. So, and I'm not showing this picture just because of the ties, although the ties are excellent. <laughs> so two of the three people in this picture were in the black and white picture of Fairchild I just showed you. Bob Noyce in the middle, Gordon Moore on the right, the third is Andy Grove, employee number three, who then becomes CEO, one of the legendary CEOs of Silicon Valley. You should also note Andy Grove. It comes to the United States in 1958 as a 20-year-old Hungarian refugee without a college degree, not speaking much English. No one would have thought he had a lot of promise, but he was, he was brought into the country because it was the right thing to do and he becomes one of the iconic business leaders of the valley. And so one of the stories of Silicon Valley and of California generally is the story of immigrants, people born elsewhere, who come in and are extraordinary contributors to this story of growth and change. The next generation, Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, the personal computers. Why does the personal computer industry, is it able to be? Because of the silicon semiconductors, these microchips getting smaller and faster where you have Intel, the company of, with the guys in the ties, marketing in the early 70s what they call a computer on a chip. Everything you need to have a computer is on this one device. So if you put a box around it and put a keyboard on it and a monitor, you got a personal computer. That's the next thing. And then the next generation com that comes from that is the dot-com generation. This is Netscape here, the early, the early founders of Netscape. Um, I think they've... I think they're all, no, a couple of them are barefoot. I, I have a whole, like, I have a whole deck of, like, barefoot founders. This, I think it was, I think photographers were like, take off your shoes, guys, because you're not a tech guy unless you don't have shoes on. Um, uh, and that's the next generation. And what funds Netscape? What founds Netscape? Netscape is funded by venture capital money that was made through the personal computer generation and the sem silicon semiconductor industry. The people who are the mentors, the um, Jim Clark, who's the older guy in this picture, was brought in as kind of adult supervision to these young guys. <laughs> That's what they call it in the Valley. Um, but this is, this is a generative flywheel. Steve Jobs once called it passing the baton in a relay race. He likened that because you're just passing it on. You're all part of the same race. Next generation, Google, Sergey and Larry, uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, computer science graduate students from Stanford. Next generation after that, oh, there's some feet. Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, what's the connective tissue? This is a connect, all these people are connected. They're connected, one, one generation is giving money to the next and mentoring the next. Mark Andreessen up there fist, fist pumping with the, with the yellow tie, he becomes a mentor, important mentor to Mark Zuckerberg 10, 15 years later when in the early days when Zuck is a so college sophomore dropout from college who doesn't know much about running a business. So this is the virtuous circle that goes, 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 goes. This is why now we have this continued concentration of capital and energy in this one place. So thinking about how you have, you keep that, that circle going, that cycle going, that including, bringing in a new generation and thinking about who are the, how, who do I want to open the door to? But also thinking about how do I keep this place, a place that is available to the people that are the next generation innovators. And these are stats about the Bay Area that I'm sure everyone here is very familiar with. High cost of housing, transportation infrastructure that doesn't connect across the region. Um, and also, we see this in the statistics about who gets to be, who, who the door is open to in the tech industry. We see a tech industry that has persistent problems with gender disparities, racial disparities, and even the next generation AI, four out of five AI specialists worldwide are male. There's a real gender imbalance, and the racial imbalance is even more stark. So thinking about these ingredients and how this comes to what you're doing here, it's, I think this is more useful than saying, here's how Silicon Valley did it, you do it too. When we think in bigger terms about what are the fundamentals and how leadership, what kind of leadership is needed to keep that flywheel going. 
then you have not only an answer to what drives resilient, dynamic regional economies, not like how do you build a tech economy, but what do you really want? It's not tech as a means to the end of dynamism and resilience. And what can leaders do, not just business leaders, and not just elected officials, but everybody together. And how you use what you know about the past to be smart about the future. Not be resigned to this is the way it's always been. Embrace change, but be smart about it and be strategic about it. And where I want to end is with another quote from another um, one of my favorite historical figures. And this might be a little bit uh, surprising to you, but I think it's worth leaving with, which is Dwight Eisenhower, in the early days of his presidency, once said this to his generals, plans are worthless, but planning is everything. And essentially what he was saying was that, you know what, we can get together and we can make a plan and we can say we're going to do this, 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 and you know what, something may happen that for forces us to throw everything out the window and do something completely different. We don't know what curveballs were going to be thrown. But the process of planning, of coming together, of realizing that we're all stakeholders in the same enterprise, of having a plan, prepares us for anything. And so be prepared. Think about what comes next. Learn from the past. Plan for readiness and surprises. Include and connect. Keep that door open. Remember that the people who Silicon Valley got going because the door opened to people that didn't have opportunities elsewhere, including kids from Grinnell, Iowa, and the, you know, scholarship kids who didn't have many resources. And always embrace what's next. And I will leave it there. But I'm not going to leave the stage because now I am really fortunate to have to, I'd like to invite to the stage um, Scott Olson from Bosch, who's the Director of Human Resources Administration, Andrea Nessler, from, who's the Director of Human Resources at Bosch, and also joining on, us on the stage is, Mrs., is Melissa Anguiano from the Economic Development Director for the City of Roseville. So three of you, come on up. the bright lights all right so I think I we have a, a um, I think what I'll do is I'll pass the, oh you oh we good oh good we got more fabulous 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 all right so thank you all for being here and for um, this is really exciting to have after talking about leadership have three leaders on the stage to talk about the same thing so here should I, should I can just keep this and keep on with this one yeah oh oh you take it you oh, thank you thank you hogging all this up. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to start um, with Scott and Andrea um, and talk about why Roseville? Are Bosch's plans, uh, what, are, what are Bosch's plans to enter the U.S. market and the semiconductor industry and how does this acquisition here fit into the big picture? Okay, I will give it a start. So hello everybody, thanks for having us here. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, also, a lot of, if I may add, um, a lot of what you said in the beginning really resonated for me because I'm just, I was, I just relocated here from Germany six weeks ago. <laughs> With my family, my two kids, my husband, and I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I really, we really feel already at home here, and thanks for all the welcoming we also received. Um, so why Roseville? This is really the best place to be right now for us. Um, Roseville happened to be the home of TSI Semiconductors, which started out um, about 40 years ago um, here. And um, Bosch, um, we have been looking um, to grow our um, semiconductor manufacturing um, capacities over the last years. You remember in the COVID times, it wasn't it wasn't uh, easy to get fridges or cars, so the the silicon scarcity that was really stemming from there. And we have explored options to 
to, to get more, to, to grow there. And um, the, the field that we are going here is a, a specific field actually of semiconductor chips. It's a very new and innovative field. It's about silicon carbide chips. Um, that's a completely new material and it's used in electric vehicles. So electric vehicles um, are supposed with using, using chips made from that material um, to be uh, last longer and recharging will be um, quicker. So um, Bosch decided to enter this field and we were looking for a strategic partner over the last year. Um, of course, business is always exploring multiple opportunities, also maybe building a new fab, but we, we thought, because we know what matters is really people, that we would be also exploring opportunities to find an existing fab. And that was when the project started, I think, a year ago. And um, somehow we found, we were lucky enough to find this place and this factory with a very talented people. And uh, from there, it, yeah, the project, we, we took it from there, I would say, for now. <laughs> That's great. Um, so, Melissa, can you talk about the city's role in this process and what do you hope for will happen to this region with the arrival of Bosch? Absolutely. So this, as a pro-business city, our role is to really always support the environment and conditions that allow businesses to be successful. And um, our role in this project has been very aligned with that principle. From the start of helping Bosch with uh, providing them all of the information they needed through their due diligence process to really getting a good understanding of what their project um, and their vision for ramping up this site looks like and how we could work with our partners in the region, the chamber, Greater Sacramento Economic Council, the county, and uh, in meeting their needs and ensuring that they're successful through that process. Mm -hmm. In terms of economic impact, I will say that Bosch's commitment to people and the community have been reflected in every conversation we've had with them. So it is going to be great to have a high quality employer in the city that not only supports the community but contributes to our quality of life. We know that this project um, is going to be an economic engine for jobs and sales and property tax revenues. But beyond this, um, a, a project of this significance and an investment of this magnitude really does uh, drive key industry growth. And we know that that will spur additional jobs, innovation, and investment, not only in our region, but throughout California and in the US market. That's great. Um Scott, to follow up on that, I know at the time there, there are 250 employees at the, the current facility. What it, tell, tell us more about your plans for that workforce, for those people transitioning, and, and what you see in terms of the, the workforce to come. Awesome. Again, um, I would also extend my thanks for the invitation and the opportunity to, to be here. Uh, really quickly, I'm Scott Olson, and I've been at that same factory uh, as it's been going through its various transformational processes. <laughs> I'll put quotes around that um, for quite a number of years. Anybody who's driven down Foothills Boulevard knows the joke that uh, what are they? What what name is it this week? Um, and but now the good news is uh, it is going to stay Bosch. I think for um, the rest of uh, at least. Uh, as long as I'm going to be around anyway, so that's good news. Um, I guess I would uh, kind of lead with the idea that the, the, the 200 plus employees that we have at the site uh, are absolutely thrilled with the idea of continued employment, right? That didn't look necessarily all that uh, probable or may maybe, I don't know, not the right word, but... Uh, it wasn't for sure that they would have continued employment the way that the uh, business was going. And now they're, they're super excited about this opportunity to, to be part of Bosch and to, uh, to be on the growth path. But uh, this is um, only a small uh, part of kind of what the overall plans are from a staffing perspective. We will be growing uh, over the course of the next several years. Uh, I've heard it said, uh, don't quote me on it, but uh, that it wouldn't be, uh, it, don't be surprised if we don't double in our size in, the, in a few short years. And that will be kind of at all levels in the organization, at the entry level, so the high school graduate, uh, that would be at the two-year college degree level in our technician class, as well as uh, engineers and scientists, that, that, so the four-year school. Mm. 
uh, persons. And so uh, there's a lot of, of new activity that's going to be happening at that plant. Yep. That's really exciting. Um, so, Melissa, what, what's the t to explain more why these types of jobs, why these jobs are so important to the region. Absolutely. Um, it's really important to have tradable sector jobs. These are jobs that are usually highly skilled um, and focus on delivering goods and services that are sold outside of our region. That's important because it brings new dollars into our local economy. And when that new wealth is spent, uh, we typically see a higher multiplier effect. It wouldn't be uncommon for one job to create three to five jobs in our local economy. And that's really important because it supports new growth, investment, and sustainability so that we're not over-reliant on any one specific uh, industry or on the recirculation of our local dollars spent here in our local economy. Mm -hmm. That's, that's important. Yeah, sometimes we, there's a focus on, you know, what, what you know, tech jobs mean. <laughs> and it's a pretty narrow of what, what actually the whole tech ecosystem um, and a really dynamic economy needs and, and how to create an inclusive economy that, that is bringing a lot of people along is really important. I, uh, thinking about community, um, Scott and Andrea, I'd, I'd love to hear more about how you all see Bosch working with the community, integrating into the community, kind of what you hope um, as being a community partner, look, what that will look like. Uh, so that's an, <clears throat> that's an outstanding question uh, and something that, that I'm sort of excited to talk about a little bit uh, because I've been at the site, I didn't really elaborate much, but uh, my days at that site as a facility go back to 1992. Am I really that old? <laughs> Holy crud. Um, so, and back in those days, it was a different brand on the roof, but our commitment to the community uh, was noticeable kind of at every corner. Uh, didn't matter what event that you were uh, hosting out there. If you needed a sponsor, you came and knocked on our door and we said yes, and on the back of the shirts it said N and an E and a C on it. Um, well, those days have faded uh, by a lot. Uh, for many years, we have not been able to do those kinds of activities and engagements and partnerships with the community that we exist within. And that's been really frustrating for our personnel, uh, for the, uh, the employees. Most of the employees who work at that facility also live in the community. And they are itching to give back to the community that they live in. And we haven't been able to really sustain that or support that and uh, now we can <laughs> thank you Bosch that we're going to be able to get back into a lot of activities partnering with schools uh, parking with uh, partnering with um, environmental uh, like creek cleanup uh, building projects um, serving you know just a variety of ways science fair judging you name it um, hit us up. We're ready to uh, to be able to try to support the activities that are taking place in the city. Yep. That's so important. It's it's. I mean, that's again so many examples of you know what when people ask me what are the what are the cornerstones of a dynamic regional economy? It's having major employers being um, you know involved in the community on the ground in a really meaningful way that isn't just that that has roots and has connection understands the the dynamics of the community and, and respects all of its stakeholders. It's great. It's really important. There's just one other way, and that's financially. And we now will have the means to economically support programs and grassroots activities, which is, you know, going back to what it said, the investment uh, and institutions and uh, and synergies. I think we're ready to participate in in in, a, in those areas in a, in a lot of different ways. So. So I'd like to, I'm, I'm here on the stage with, with three leaders, transformational leaders, and I'd love to ask you each in turn what transformational leadership means to you when you hear that. What, what do you, um, what, what resonates with you and, and how, how would you define that? And I'll start with Andrea. Yes, certainly, and that's also a very interesting question because I think out there you, wa you won't find uh, one definition, of course, for that uh, thing, but... Um, I mean, throughout my career at Bosch, and it's 21 years now, actually, since I started, I have found um, always um, supervisors, leaders, that uh, put a lot of trust in me and in my fellow colleagues, 
um, that were always giving me a meaningful task, um, meaningful and even though maybe the challenges were big, there was always optimism that we would do it, some get it done somehow. So um, that, I, that I found always really inspirational. And also that my leaders are always asking me to, to be critical also, to, to question uh, what we are going to do. Um, so for me personally, I, 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 throughout my career, I found this um, at Bosch all the time. And I'm very excited now with this undertaking here because it's not an easy task. It's not a plug and play game. What we are trying to do here, it's really um, a big project that we will be doing, that we will be starting to deliver silicon carbide chips in 2026. It's, we have, of course, the means and we have a really talented team, but we still, we will really have to be very strong as a team to get this done. And I have the full trust in the workforce here on site, also in the colleagues in Germany, which was, uh, with, we will be working really closely across the continents. And um, I'm very inspired by the start also of our cooperation. It's a big fun to work with the team and also with the colleagues here on site. Yeah. yeah. I'm not so sure. I don't. <laughs> Could you have come to me first on that? That's, uh, how do I, because I, she hit some of the points that are super key for me as well. For me, transformational leadership really has to do with um, what she said, that this idea of trust, mm. empowerment. Uh, and I think, you know, one of the things that I remember very specifically that happened, so there's, a very senior level person, I don't fully understand the Bosch organizational structure yet, but this is a very, um, a person, I'm just gonna say muckety muck. So this was a muckety muck that came, who said to me, um, <coughs> and said to se several of my colleagues that, um, if this transaction goes through and if we begin to uh, do this transformation of the site, I want you questioning everything. If a, if a Bosch leader comes to you and says, go do this, and if you don't think that's the right thing to do and you have sound reason why you think, then, then voice that opinion, then speak up and be heard. Uh, and I just felt like, wow, that's, uh, to hear that from a very senior level executive was very empowering and very, uh, it, it made me feel as though I mattered. Uh, or and that my experience and that my yeah my training and experience that it was going to be it was going to continue to be valuable even as we uh, embarked down this new pathway together and I think I would just close with this uh, note that I made to myself which was something that was just really key and that's the like Bosch did not buy or purchase the Roseville factory because they hoped that we would achieve an outcome. They bought the factory because they knew we would. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that says they are, they have confidence in our ability to be transformed as, a, as an operation. And they have the full confidence. Yeah, my turn. <laughs> we, we should have left you for last, Scott. <laughs> um, so, so transformational leadership, I think, is the ability to seize opportunities, um, take risk, and, and potentially fail at those opportunities, right? And, and learn from them. But, um, you know, doing it collaboratively and inclusively, I think, uh, that's transformational leadership. And our city's had a long history with innovation and transformational project from NEC to HP campus. Um, and um, we've had a lot of learning lessons along the way, um, but we've built and grown our city and we've done the placemaking um, that's necessary to meet those needs. Yeah, that's so important. And I think you know, one of the, you know, in your answer is sort of reminding that this is a different type of um, economic development story. It isn't, um, a new company comes to town and is breaking ground on a, and bringing a new industry to town. This is a place that has a history 
Uh, this is a place that you're building on what came before. Here, there's a, there is a long history and memory of, of what the possibilities can be. Uh, again, I think that the, the Placer Valley is so, you know, it's, it's seen the upside of this um, pandemic era, post-pandemic era, reshuffling of tech jobs. Um, and also, just to underscore that the kind of astounding, the CHIPS Act is a big deal. Um, and I'm, I'm someone who studies like big deal government expenditure for a living. Um, not exclusively that, but you know, I, if you study the Cold War and the space race and moonshots, I mean, the, where were, there were big bets made. They could have been a big failure. <laughs> I mean, the moonshot was, whoo. Um, and, and, but, but having that, those resources, you know, as much as, um, you know, yes, sure, doing business with the government and depending on government grants, whether they be state or federal, comes with, comes with its headaches, particularly for lo at the local level. But there are resources that a government, things government can do that at, at, at every level, including the local and metropolitan level and county level, that no other entity can do. And, um, and there are, and it's an absolutely critical partner in this. But having a business that is, uh, you know, coming in and willing to, you know, maybe you're coming in from somewhere else, but willing to be given, you know, be a partner rather than just a, uh, a newcomer. That is, you know, those again are, are really critical things. I mean, to go back to, you know, Hewlett Packard being kind of the anchor original homegrown startup of the Valley was not only important because it was a successful company, but it was a company like Fairchild Semiconductor whose alumni went on to found other companies and whose business philosophy, this management by walking around, you're, you guys are sounding like the HP way over there in a good way, the, the good, the old, old school. But, you know, the original um, kind of collaborative, like, if you have a good idea, I want to hear it, even if it's something that is, might be above your pay grade. That is um, a, a kind of a really critical glue to make um, a kind of really resilient, dynamic, multi-generational economic success story. And I, I'm really uh, excited for what you guys have ahead, and, and you have incredible talent and, you know, come together and continue to use it. It's, it's great stuff. Um, so I want to thank everyone for, for being here and listening and for you all to, for Bosch to come in and kind of really exciting to hear all that's about to happen. And, um, and I'm really excited to be up in Seattle and watch what the Placer Valley is going to do next because I think it's going to be some pretty cool stuff. Um, so please join me in thanking our guests. And I think you all have about 12 minutes until you go to your next breakout room and or your next breakout session. So thank you for being such a really fantastic audience and have a great rest of your day. Whatever wanna tell the seam of someone's dream.